Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Chazen, who is in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto, which is my alma mater. He is, in fact, one of my thesis supervisors. Um, so everything I learned about lithics, I learned from this guy right here, for better or for worse, those of you who are doing lithics with me right now. Um, so I met Michael when I first arrived at the University of Toronto as a brand new shiny PhD student, and it was his second year there as faculty. Um, and the other person that was my co-supervisor was away on sabbatical for the year. So Michael kind of took me under his wing and got me started in the graduate program there and got me very, very interested in lithics. Before coming there, I was um, definitely into the geo side of things, which those of you who know me know I still do. But he really got me engaged with lithics and thinking about them in very different ways than I had been taught about them before. Um, and he's going to speak a little bit about some of that today. He uh, is a Paleolithic archaeologist, um, although he has worked in Israel on lower Paleolithic sites um, and published quite extensively on all time periods within the Paleolithic. He's now also working on a Roman site in Israel. <laughs> around the purpose of that site, and for the last 15 years or so, he's been working in South Africa at Global Work Cave, um, some of which we will speak about today. He is going to talk about a book that he's recently published, amongst his many uh, very impactful publications, um, a new book that is right here called The Reality of Artifacts. So perhaps without further ado, I would uh, like to welcome Michael Chase. So this is an informal talk, which I like the furnishings because now I feel informal. Uh, I'll say I've never been to Berkeley before, and it's really a, a pleasure to be here. And a few, but there are a few connections. The first is, as Lisa says, she was one of the first graduate students I worked with. And I was like, hey, you know, this being a professor is not so bad. They just go on and get their work done. Of course, years since, I realized that Lisa was one of the most uh, remarkable students that I had the opportunity to work with. And then she brought along Danielle McDonald, who's something you know who's equally remarkable. So, um, yeah, so there's that connection. The other is, um, as Lisa mentioned, for the past 15 years, I've been working with a very large team that we kind of collaborate together to work on the Vandeverk Cave as well as other sites in the Northern Cape Province on uh, just absolutely remarkable early Stone Age record. And it happens, Vandeverk is kind of one of, as Francis Thackeray says, the greatest site of its type in the universe. Well, you know, that's pretty nice, but it's um, it's pretty unique site. It, has an archaeological record going back almost two million years. It's probably the longest continuous, not continuous, but kind of the longest sequence of any site, any cave site in the world. Um, but the first excavations there were actually from Berkeley for the University of California expedition to Africa. Uh, did some sounding. So one of my goals in coming out here, and this is happily been helping me arrange this is to see what the heck came out of the ground and came over from uh, from Vandenberg to um, California. So all of that made me very happy to come over and added to it as an opportunity to talk to you a bit about what I consider a certain level, uh, you know, I don't mean to, to be dismissive, but almost like a vanity project. Now it's published by a real publisher because it's rubbish, okay, it's not that I went out and published my own book, but um, it's the first time that I wrote something that the motivation wasn't that I had a lot of data that I needed to report or that I tried some kind of you know, analysis that I needed, but that I really wanted to try to structure and to put into some coherent form my ideas about the artifact world. Um, my background to that comes largely from my life as an archaeologist. I worked with, I worked in the past with ceramics. I now worked for quite a long time with lithics. I'm very much an artifact 
person in the archaeological realm. And a long time ago, I also had a background as a craftsperson working with making ceramics, which kind of really shaped my view of, of things. And I wanted to try to um, put my ideas into coherent form. And this was helped a lot by teaching a course in the anthropology department at Toronto that was on, I was sitting in a departmental meeting and I decided that I'd try to create a course that didn't have a colon in it. Because everyone had these long titles. So I said, well, I want to propose a course called Artifacts. And from, that's actually the genesis of this book. Was, and then I teach a course where a group of students from across the university, actually it wasn't only anthropology, thought about what artifacts are and how we should think about them. I teach a similar course in now we have a material culture program at Victoria College, which is one of the first in Canada, for sure. And again, it's a very open-ended discussion of what artifacts are. And before I describe the structure of the book, I'll contradict myself a bit that I say that it's a vanity project. But it's a vanity project in the sense that I think it really matters. I, I think that there's something missing in contemporary discourse in general, um, although it's emerging here and there, about the importance of artifacts. Um, those of you who have read Jane Bennett's book, for example, um, is, I don't agree with most of what she says, but I do agree with her passion in a sense that this is actually important, that the way that we interact with artifacts shapes who we are at a very fundamental level. And it's something that we kind of overlook. And adding to that, and to me the sense of urgency, is I get very, very frustrated that in that discussion of materiality, we often call it, whether it's in computer science, or it's in cognitive science, or whether it's in, um, you name the domain, right? you know, philosophy, the data and examples they're drawing on from the archaeological literature go back to the 1930s. You know, and I'm a, I'm a big advocate for archaeology. I think we do unbelievably interesting work. And I think that there's an importance of bringing the new data and insights into discussion with um, the theoretical literature. And particularly for the Paleolithic, I had found that this wasn't happening, so I'd give it a go. Um, the difficulty, though, as one of the reviewers of my proposal pointed out, was that the, the way I was developing my ideas, and this is intentional, was not through the normal sequence of saying, I'm going to take all of that archaeological writing about the nature of reality, let's put it that way. I always try to avoid the ontology word because I don't know what it means. <laughs> I didn't want to do that review of the ontological term as it's called sometimes. Simply because I don't think I'm the person to do it. I don't think I'm the person to summarize this literature because I'm not a part of that discussion in a central way. So there is an extent to which I hope some of you may read this book at some point. You might say, wait, why isn't he summarizing more these kind of how he fits with these other archaeological discussions? And I, I, I accept that as kind of a limitation, but it's almost an intentional limitation. Um, luckily, I couple of colleagues who do that kind of work pretty well. So, that, that, you know, I think there are books of that sort available. Okay, so the first, so what I want to do now is talk to you about five minutes about the structure and overall argument of the book. It's pretty short, too, so that's why I can do that briefly. Um, then I want to talk about this central chapter, which is kind of a pivot chapter in the middle of the book about invisibility, which um, I think is a pretty cool uh, topic, and explain to you what I mean with a couple of examples. I'm watching the clock in back, and I'll try to finish by about quarter up. Um, 
because it would be immensely interesting to me to get some feedback and have some challenges or some questions um, so that I can learn something as well. Okay, so the first point is what I mean by artifacts. And the goal of this book was to argue that artifact is not a kind of thing, but it's a status of things. Um, now I'm at the University of California, Berkeley, so John Searle um, is a known name, uh, and it's largely inspired by his ideas about status functions, about how we create social realities. In his argument, it's simply through speech acts. One of my goals is to, is to argue that, in fact, the using and making of objects, even the appropriation of objects, is also a kind of, um, it has that same function, can um, make something something else. Um, that I think he overemphasizes um, speech acts in, in developing this concept. But overall, I really like his idea of the centrality of these status functions that change the nature of a social grouping of a project. And what's different a little bit from uh, some arguments, for instance, uh, it's a more nuanced and absolute difference than Lambros Malaforis, for example, who speaks very eloquently about the agency of materials. I put the agency very much on the side of the humans. I think that materials have affordances, and materials definitely push back. But I see that what happens with the artifact world is artifacts are things that we bring into our human conception of time. Then in very simple terms, an artifact is a thing that has a past, present, and future. If objects, material objects, outside of that status don't. They just are in the world. Um, we as humans, we exist in a world in which past, present, and future exist simultaneously. And I think in those things that we brought into our world and into our sense of self, and a lot of what I write about is this construction of self and the role of material in that, I think we give these things that past, present, and future. There's a fun kind of idea that comes out of that about archaeology, which is I see archaeology as a, essentially a creative act. That for me, from, for the purposes of this discussion, an artifact, what we would call an archaeological artifact, while it's in the ground, actually is not an artifact in the sense that I'm talking about here. Um, when we recover an object, and I write about this, and put it in a bag, and label the bag, and put it in our collections, suddenly it becomes an artifact again. It's been an artifact in the past, it becomes an artifact in our own life. So artifacts can go through cycles. I think the artifact that's an archaeological artifact is very different from the artifact in its first life cycle. Um, and it's, it's nature of its embeddedness is different. So that's the central argument, and one aspect of that is that artifacts take on a certain hybridity, that they're at once material and cultural, and cultural, or whatever you want to call this second term. And th that's what makes archaeology so interesting, right? Is we deal with these unique things, that it's not enough to just do material science on it, it's not enough to just do you know, linguistic analysis. They're not just ideas, they're real things. Um, but they have this hybrid nature, and I'll come back to that hybridity in a few minutes. So the book goes through a number of discussions. First, I talk about the role of concepts, um, of ideas in the mind in constructing the artifact world, in the making of artifacts. And of course, this plays in discussions of typology and the role of you know, what are cognitive constructs versus material realities. Um, and from there, I talk about artifacts and the body, the way that artifacts become absorbed in our sense of self, connect to our body, and also have the potential to um, 
expand our world, expand actually ourselves. And I became very interested in this idea that artifacts that belong to us, that we still have this relationship with, we don't have to have physical contact about it. Um, so there's a Socratic idea of you hang a coat on a hook and it's sitting there on a hook somewhere, but it's still your possession. And for me that's very evocative, that there's this ability to extend the self to things that are far away, that are no longer um, part of you. Even not, no longer physically attached to you, but they are in a sense a part of who you are. Um, Lisa mentioned that I work on a Roman site. I, I don't do much there except tell them they should think more about geology. But uh, it's a very evocative article about, that I used as well that, about slave collars. In the Roman Empire, you have the development of these collars that would be worn by slaves with a tag on their, on, that, that could say, hey, I'm a slave. Grab me and take me back to my owner. Um, and these slave colors are evocative of the, of the way that artifacts have the capacity not only to extend ourselves, you know, not only to the outwards, um, but also to um, shape and, and constrain uh, our world in very essential, very powerful ways. And to give you a sense of the kind of archaeological data that's relevant is, again, one of Lisa's colleagues, co-graduate students, at the University of Toronto, Jane Wilkins, who had worked with me, has um, argued, I think, very compellingly that some of the artifacts we find at the site of Katipan are spears dating back 500,000 years ago. And I started to think about the way that composite tools allow them to stretch tools beyond simply an extension of the hand, and then ultimately the development of long-range projectile points allows us to push that further yet again. Both of them, all of those are domains in which there's a lot of contemporary, current, active research that's generally um, not brought into theoretical discussion. Okay, so now I'll, uh, I'll be talking in a couple minutes about this sense of the invisible, um, but just to know that it's kind of a brand, it's kind of a breaking point between these things asking about the mind and the body and, the, and how, how artifacts fit with both, you know, cognitive models and um, the physical sense of self. Um, I then go on to talk about art, and it, the reason why I didn't talk about that here is that it builds on this idea that the invisible it would be a slightly more protracted talk that I... I see out of our work at Vandenberg Cave, where we have very early evidence for the use of ochre and specularite and of unique places, going back about a half million years. I argue for a very gradual development of art out of a sense of wrapping the interiority of the materials and the essence. So, in a sense, something that's invisible about these objects. And then in the last part of the book, I challenge a bit my own bias towards the human, um, that I'm very um, critical of Jane Bennett's ideas about um, materiality being vibrant, but on the other hand, she has a point. Um, and there is a sense that in some cases, material can become vibrant in a sense, can have an autonomy from its human Kind of, you know, interlocutor. Uh, some cases of that come from ethnographic cases where material actually is thought of as being alive, um, and I consider those. But I really, one of my main focuses there was to think about the, um, the, the difficult aspect of drawing boundaries around the artifact world, that there are things that are just too big or too... Big. So if I say that a Boeing 747 is an artifact, you say, yeah, but is it really? And I, I, this is a great... This was the funnest book to write ever. I mean, what a, 
I got to write about my fear of flying, which working in South Africa is a terrible thing to have, because every year I spend 18 hours terrified in two directions. So, so I got to think about where does that, how does that fit into me? And actually it, it took me back to Lisa's work at Harana, which I think is, and she gave me great pictures too, which very nice. But then, I argue that there's a sense with architecture that we're seeing the development of something that develops into what I call machines. Things that have their autonomy, their own temporal autonomy that structures us rather than us structuring them. You know, the Charlie Chaplin movie is what I used as an example, you know, where Charlie is trying to tighten some bolts or something, but they keep coming faster and faster and he kind of goes crazy. So, you know, that's the sense of where we fit ourselves to the time of machines is something we're all very familiar with. But I think there's an argument to saying that actually at Quran we're finding the very earliest stages of that. Because the Harana huts, weirdly enough, they come back to over and over, which I, it's always strikes me as a bit odd. And Lisa's has written quite a bit about possibly what they were doing when they were leaving these places. And then we see in the PPMB and the pre pottery meal that they be an intensification of architecture until you have built environments that survive past a single individual's life and structure people, structure the world that people come into. So anyway, so that's, that's an argument for um, a sense of autonomy of objects. And it's where this sense of using artifact as a status rather than a type of thing allows for these kind of um, jagged edges or kind of, um, so that, you know, is the electrical grid an artifact? Not really. But can I draw a line that says, no, this is where artifacts start, start and things like the grid start? No, I can't. That's not terribly problematic. And then the final part is an argument for an ecology with objects, that we should be, in thinking about ecology and the future, we should be thinking about the role of artifacts, the profound role in our lives, and include that in our thinking about ecology. Okay, so I left myself. 15 minutes to talk about invisibility. And invisibility, part of, the, part of this comes from talking about cognitive functions and the role of, I write quite a bit on the Chez Nicolas in mythic production. And I, as a person who's flint that, not very beautifully, but quite a bit, and has worked as a potter, I know that you need to know things in order to act in the material world. And I try to elucidate what I mean by that, and I. I think I have some good things to say, I hope. But this sense of that there are aspects that are not tangible, that are um, present or part of the artifact world. And so in a sense, this chapter is arguing for a second hybridity. If artifacts are at once cultural and, uh, and natural, they're also at once visible, tangible, and they have an element of invisibility. And the first thing that, that that gave me a couple of interesting things to think about, and the first that I find to be a very intriguing idea has to do with the very origins of human tool use. Uh, again, I went to, I, I do stove tools, so I went to a faculty meeting in the graduate faculty around when Lisa started, and I said, I want to teach a course in lithic analysis, and they said, well, what is that? And I said, well, I have a, I, you know, it's how people make stone tools and that, so they say, you mean breaking rocks? And I said, yes, I have a PhD from Yale University in breaking rocks, so it must be respectable <laughs> topic, right? Um, and I say that a lot, you know, in kind of self-deprecating way of like, yeah, it's just breaking rocks, but it's actually false when you really start to think about it. And it has implications for understanding, I think, the evolution of human technology. Let's think about it this way. How many of you, when you're teaching introductory things or thinking about it, say, well, chimpanzees break nuts, and that's pretty much the same thing as making an old one chopper. I would never quite exactly say that, but I say things along those lines. 
they're both similar physical operations. In which case, they're both likely similar cognitive and, and physical operations. But there's a difference, and it's a very, to me, a very interesting difference. It turns out there's quite a large literature on breaking nuts because if you're processing palm nuts, you use machines now and you don't want to break nuts. So there's a whole thing on physics of breaking nuts. And what you're doing when you break a nut, I spent weeks on this, so you know, it's a great period of my life, but <laughs> when you're breaking a nut, you're causing failure in a structure. Right? You have a physical structure that has a, a coherence, and you're causing it to fail. You're loading it with force, and it fails and breaks. That's really something that can be seen by cause and effect quite easily without inferring anything invisible there. It, it, it's, it's, it's apparent. Um, making a chopper is actually a different <laughs> thing. It's what you're doing is you're causing fracture. And fracture is breaking molecular bonds and separating a piece into two different masses, okay? They're distinct mechanical processes. Now, okay, you know, all of you teach and think about these things or 20 years ago heard about them and, and, and you say, well, but Kanzi, the chimpanzee, makes stone tools, right? And so I went back and looked at what does Kanzi the chimpanzee do? Because I remember Nick Top did this work with Kanzi and, you know, you know, there's Fig Newtons in a box tied with a string. Chimps love Fig Newtons. If you can get Kanzi to mimic you making stone tools, you can show how similar we are to chimpanzees, right? But Kanzi doesn't make stone tools like any older one stone tool maker made them. What Kanzi does is he treats um, a rock like a nut, basically. He's trying to cause failure in the rock. So what you're getting is not causing fracture, you're getting um, pounding. So Kanzi will sit and smash the rocks together 30 times. Now, I'll come back to how I know they're not doing that in the old one. But I know they're not, you know, it's not an inference or a, it's like, well, it's an inference, but it's a strong inference. But Kanzi does that. Initially, what Kanzi did, it's a very funny story if you haven't heard it. Initially, the way Kanzi would make it, chimps are really smart. What would you do if you needed to break a rock and you, you would throw the rock on the floor, right? Because Kanzi lived in a cement floored enclosure. And that was stone tool manufacturing. Eventually, he took him outside to solve floor. So then he's like, okay, well, I see this guy, Nick Toth, sitting there doing that. Like, I'm smart enough to do what he's doing. But there's not an understanding of the underlying invisibility, which is that what Nick is doing is causing fracture, propagating fracture through this material. Hansi does fracture it but it's through an action that's basically to cause failure. How do I know that they're not doing this in the old one? Well, if I bang two rocks together, I cause an incipient cone of percussion. Anybody who's napped for an hour, you've done that a lot. You know, my first like, two months of wind napping, I'm like, God, why doesn't anything come up? Well, if you look when you're smashing a rock and nothing's coming up, it leaves a fracture cone in it. And we can see these, they're preserved forever. And you see that in terms of how the cores look, you can see it. And they exist in all the one assemblages, but they're really rare. Moreover, if I go not to 2.5 million years ago, but I go to 2.3 million years ago, and this is where, again, archaeologists have been doing work that's not being taken seriously. If I look at the site of Lokalala, what the people are doing, or homo whatever is doing, is taking a block of rock, conceiving of it as having a surface, and repeatedly striking along the surface of that, the circumference of that surface, up to 20, 25 times, not recurrently. 
So that's not the same as I'm smashing again and again to cause this thing to fail. So my argument is actually that this suggests that already at this initial stage of stone tool production, we're seeing hominins work on the basis of an invisible, which is fraction. And that's a different thing than what chimpanzees do. Now, some of you know that there's the Lamequa, which is 3.2 million years old. There's some stone tools there. We don't know a heck of a lot about them yet, except their description. And they may be more like what Kanzi does. You know, it's still not clear enough from the data that's available. And that, to me, is a super interesting question. Um, why, do, why does this invisibility matter? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from, in part, the discussion about theory of mind. And a graduate student colleague of mine, Daniel Covinelli, has convinced me and that chimpanzees don't have the same kind of theory of mind that humans do. And that humans act on a theory of mind which is an invisible thing. You know, like, you are really bored. You know, that's not by who, not, but it's my <laughs> ability to say that you are an entity with a perspective like my own. And he argues that chimpanzees don't use those kinds of cues. And I actually kind of agree with it. He also argues that in terms of chimpanzee's ideas about physics, that they don't work on the basis of invisibles. And I think archaeology can add to that, that actually, by the time, by about 2.5 million years ago, humans are. Um, I'll just talk about one other aspect of this um, idea about invisibles that I think is kind of interesting but not different for those of you well I'll talk about it rapidly two parts. Okay, so uh, there's a philosopher Paul Bloom who's asked whether water is a uh, artifact. Can Sprite be an artifact? I'll cut to the chase because I, I mean I have a whole elaborate thing of thinking about it. But my argument is Actually, Sprite's only an artifact if you have a Sprite bottle. You know, only an archaeologist would think this way, right? And I think that's actually true. That the minute I, I have a friend who collects water from the Vaal River, because it's sacred water, and he takes it home, the minute he pours it out, it's water in the river again. You need the artifact in order to make intangible things into, into to have this artifact status. That Water, um, air, they, bubbles, there's another guy who writes about bubbles. Um, <laughs> they can't be artifacts because they're not tangible. They don't maintain a form. I can't hold on to them. But I can make them artifacts because artifact status is what I call sticky. If I put water in a Sprite bottle, I can charge a buck fifty for it because it's Sprite. It's this thing. And we have an archaeological example that's beautiful for this, which is um, pilgrim flasks, right? Where you would bring water back from pilgrimages. And that water was sacred water. And of course, what we find is the flasks. And the sense that, so the sense that the artifact status, we can't include in it things that aren't tangible. But, they can become artifacts when they're enclosed or when they're contained they're within an artifact, within a tangible thing. This relates to our work on fire. Um, and see, because I have to get fired, because one of our came and fired. It's important. So Francesco Berta, Paul Goldberg, who are members of the one of our cave research project, Realize that in a million year old context, we have clear micromorphological evidence for fire. Um, that was great because it opens up a whole new line of research, and we now think we can push that back considerably earlier the use of fire in this cave. That was great, except that at the time I was writing a an article about how early humans didn't use fire, so it was kind of annoying, um, but 
the way out of that for me is to question how do humans interact with fire? And in a sense, to ask when does fire come to interact with an artifact world, come to be enclosed? Because we can all think of cases where there are sacred fires, which are in a sense artifactual, but that requires the sense of enclosure. What I've argued um, separately from Francesco, this is not his, or Paul, that this is completely uh, um, to blame, is that in fact what we have is a long prehistory of fire. That fire is not uh, an on-off switch. And one component of that is the development of things like lamps that enclose, that enfold fire, and that bring it into the domain of the artifact world. One of the intriguing things about Neanderthal use of fire, the Homo erectus use of fire, where we have very clear evidence for the use of fire, is that one of the last things to develop is even the most basic enclosure around it, rings of stone, something that we do instinctually. You know, how many of us go camping and say, let's build a fire without first saying, oh, here's a ring of you know, stones to put around it. That was not there's nothing complicated about that. There's nothing cognitively, oh my god, a ring of stones. They could do this, but it wasn't the way that they were interacting with fire. Um, so there does seem to be a stage in the use of fire where fire comes to be pulled into this artifact world. But I would argue that fire liquids are out in and of themselves outside the artifact realm, but they can be pulled into it. it, it it's an immensely, what I like to say, a sticky um, domain, that it, it can pull things in through this process of enclosure. So I'm very proud of myself, because I wanted to leave time um, to get some questions and feedback, uh, because uh, you know, I realize that these are questions that all of us think about. You know, these are essential archaeological questions and issues, and it's been, uh, you know, a bit provocative on my part to think that I can um, try to develop a general framework. The only thing that I would urge you as a group to think about is how, in contemporary for the 21st century California, how important archaeological work on materiality is. It's not just a bonus. And I, I've come to feel this quite passionately <coughs> teaching, I teach a first year seminar. And the sense that I have of students, young people, and, but older, us, us losing control over our relationship to materiality as digital technology becomes more and more powerful and more and more seductive and kind of all-encompassing. And I think this question of the importance of the archaeological perspective of the long-term role of human relationship to materiality, and what I try to argue here is how it pervades our very sense of who we are as people. I think that there's something kind of important there to, to think about. So, yeah, so if there are any questions or comments that I'm totally wrong, that'd be fine. <laughs> in your mind and then exists 
really. And so it will like exist in the physical world. And so in a way, these artifacts are coming together to make something that's more than the sum of their parts. What What are your thoughts on this commonality? Yeah. So so there's a real danger. So Tim Ingold is very articulate in, in critiquing the hylomorphic model, which I agree with him 100 percent. That you don't. Like any of you have made anything, you don't kind of, and this is a danger in the way that I talk, is you don't have a thing in your head and it just like, poof, it's there, you know, that it's through the interactions with the materials that things come into being, and he's right 100%, particularly with architecture. I think one of the weaknesses, and it's actually, I'm starting a project on a very different kind of topic, and one of the first things that I realized is that one of the weaknesses of my thinking is not seeing these kinds of linkages. We know what we talk about as assemblages, you know, that, that how does that work? And then, and how do, how do, there's always a, a danger of cutting things off into parts, and that's not my intention, um, but of trying to, um, so for example, you know, Karana, you know, you can, you know it's, it's so much food for thought, so to speak, but, you know, where is the limit between the natural environment and the built environment? You know, is it an absolute limit between, you know, the work that we see as a landscape versus the built hut? So I think all those issues are ones that I don't have great answers to, but they're super important, yeah, but, you know, really relevant. And, yeah. Uh, I haven't read the book, so this is probably a really stupid question, but phylogenetically go far afield to the California sea otters, extractive foragers that use tools in some fields. Uh, Dorothy Fergazi's work with the, with the uh, monkeys in South America, uh, chimpanzee work with humans. And my question is about invisibility because you attribute things to the older makers of stone tools that you don't attribute to these extractors. But the food inside the object is invisible to the extractor in each one of those money okay. So how do you can you can you explain a little bit further in this notion how how invisibility applies to those different yeah. So, so you mean like if I'm doing bone marrow extraction, yeah. I can't see the bone marrow until I smash it. Right. Um, and well, and I think that's the, it's not I mean, the different. It's not that other creatures aren't super capable of doing things that are complex. And so, you know, one thing is that any predator is capable of taking a living animal and transforming it into to meat, you know, so, um, which is something very different than what it was before. Uh, my sense is that when you're looking at chimpanzees, that learning is more, um, it's more concrete, you know, that the, and again, that's Danny Covinelli's words, that it's more, they're working on the basis of what's there in front of them, you know, and you can learn a lot by just doing things and saying, okay, that's what happens, or I've seen that happen. You're not understanding, and it's not that we're, on, it's not that you're constructing some other thing that goes on that's not apparent. It's, and the thing with fracture that strikes me is that with fracture, I there's nothing in the rock that tells me, okay, it's here. There's nothing that having seen someone do it before tells me, okay, I do what they did and this will happen. I actually have to say, I don't have to understand fracture mechanics because obviously that's pretty complex. I have to say, I understand that there's some underlying principle and, and infer that outwards. And that's what I mean by invisibility figure. And I don't think for cracking nuts that that's involved. I think it's 
you're doing things, making observations, and saying, okay, let me do that again. And you don't have to, you don't have to, in a lot of ways, inferring invisibility is not adaptive. I'm not saying it's a better way of cognitively operating. I'm just saying it's kind of different. Um, and I realize that's a bit um, subtle, but it's, it's not at all to say that it's a cognitive advance, because a lot of times, I think you could argue that humans make pretty poor choices because they make these kind of uh, inferences or guesses about invisible things. But fracture is different, and it, you can't observe it happening. You can't see it. It's instantaneous. It's not really instantaneous, but it's really, really fast. And um, it's not in the material itself. You know, that it, it, it's not already there. How you talk about that, how you think about that, could be all kinds of different ways. But that would be the, the argument. Just to follow up on that, um, you know, I I'm not sure I would uh, accept from thinking unquestionably about the fact that fracture is not there. Because some kinds of rock will fracture because of its inherent property. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why people are making stone tools out of flint and obsidian yeah. and so forth, and not making them some very good stone tools out of basalt or something, although they do do that. But anyway, so there is something there. Yeah, well, there's a quality of the material. That, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. No, that it's... But I'm not... Say, let's say that, you know, human evolution started with them making stone tools out of feldspar. I'd be like, okay, they're following cleavage planes, and that's all there is to it. They break the rock, and it breaks them. And if I didn't... And again, this is to me an argument of the validity and importance of really good archaeological research. So the Local Online Project is one of the first refitting projects to, well, certainly for these early time periods. So the, it's a project where you're refitting flakes to cores. And I'd be a little bit more hesitant to make these arguments based on the Hadar sites, based on the data we have. But with Local Online, it's like, wait a minute, there's no two sides to this thing. Well, there is once you see it that way. But it's not dictated by the form of the matter. But they're imposing that there. They're making it happen. And then, I mean, I've looked at a lot of older ones stuff, and it's um, they're really good. You know that there are in constant. It, it, do you do like when that thing with like some kind of course? <laughs> yeah. It, their assemblage isn't an old one assemblage. Like, as it struck you, it's like, wait a minute. Because they're like pounding in the middle of the thing, and you're like, no, no, I'll go to the edge and look for an angle. And they're like, no, I can't get my head around that. I think part of the problem, I once taught, this is for Megal to tell a gender story. So I once was teaching a group of high school students out of Flint now. And I was like, who wants to try it? And all these big guys are like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And they're all like pounding these things, you know, because they're like being cavemen, you know, like trying to show how strong they are. Nothing happens, and I say, so finally a woman says, yeah, you know, a young woman says, yeah, I'll try it. And of course she's more intelligent, you know, she's not, <laughs> she doesn't have this fantasy of mine, so she's like, okay, how would I organize myself to, and yeah, I work great. And um, that was a learning thing for me, and I that it's, there's an, there's a kind of thinking that's involved. And, yeah, no, I think it, we do it in our lab course. And I always look, and it's painful to watch, because there are so many step fractures and hinge fractures and crazy stuff. I'll just say one note, I know that we're running out of time, but one, I, it's not directly relevant, but it's so interesting. That in Bundaberg, what we're finding in the Oldowan context, which is roughly 1.8 million years old, so younger, um, is small tools. And we have the same thing at Sturkfontein. And we actually have the same thing in every Oldowan site. To me, it's one of the great questions right now is why is there, we all know about choppers and that because the 
Vega. But a major component of Oldowan technology, and in southern Africa it seems the major component, is making things that are about a centimeter, two centimeters of size. Intentionally, repetitively, that's what they're doing. So that's kind of a you know, separate issue, but that kind of a question. So yeah, no, it's a good point about raw material, but I don't think they're following like colors in the rock or layers in the rock. 